I'd find myself just defending the Muslim position, even though I'm not really Muslim yet. Yeah. Like I haven't taken my shahada yet, but I found myself wanting to represent the Muslim position. And I remember stopping eating pork. Like I actually remember yeah. the moment when I actually stopped that. Yeah. Wow. I remember being in a restaurant with my family. We've been out for a nice meal, and I'd had something with pork in it, or whatever. I'm sitting down and thinking like. I want you to do it. <laughs> like, yeah. it, like it just, like it all just hadn't like stacked up for me really. Wow. Like I, just, I found myself at a point thinking, like, just what am I doing? Like I just, I realised some like, so, some desire to to be one of the Muslims in myself mm. at, the, at that point. You know, something as simple as tawhid as well, actually. Like, you think that we have, we make things so complicated for ourselves in this dunya. Like I'm studying Zoroastrianism and Taoism and all these different isms and stuff. And then there's like tawhid, just believe in Allah, worship the Creator, not the creation. Like it's something that like that shouldn't that yeah. shouldn't be rocket science to us. <laughs> like that should be really simple. So so when I came across that and I thought Subhanallah, th this thing is actually what it's about. Like they like thought I, they they assumed that some shahad had taken place because yeah, at this point yeah. I've memorized some Quran at this point. Because wow. all this time I've been in my bedroom listening to the Quran. Like yeah. I know about ten pages of Surah Al-Baqarah at this point. No way. So like I'm si so like I'm sitting with the kids. Wait, right, stop, stop. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. What? What? Why? Why Man did the delay? Why ten the pages yeah. of Surah Bakra and he's not a Muslim? What are you oh. doing? <laughs>Assalamu alaikum, welcome to another episode of Rerooted Raw. Today I've got a special guest, Sam. Assalamu alaikum, bro. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thanks for having me, Akhir. That's right. And guys, he's not he's not um, Turkish or Albanian. He's actually English, although he might look... <laughs> <laughs> we we, we, we went, went to the masjid today uh, to pray Jummah, and uh, the, the, <laughs> the imam was like, Afghani? For the fourth time today. Yeah, really? Uh, <laughs> Afghani? No. Albani? Uh, English mate, so yeah, it's a panala. I think it's the sharp like lines that beautiful mashallah. It must be that it. That, that must be it. Yeah, I've come too well groomed today. So I, uh, I, well, you're here now because I came across your YouTube channel mm -hmm. and your TikTok, and you're um, you're an Arabic teacher, and you love language, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're a revert, so I want to start right right to beginning before you're Muslim. So how were you raised? Like, what was your belief system before you were Muslim? Okay. Um, so I grew up around no Muslims, right? Like I, I had probably become a Muslim before I'd ever even met one. Yeah. Um, so I was actually born in Northampton for the, for the viewers who aren't like based in the UK. That's a little town in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, when I was about 11, we moved to the countryside, an area called Cornwall. And um, Cornwall, I highly recommend it. Anybody who comes down, we'll take good care of them, inshallah. It's an absolutely beautiful part of the UK. Yeah, it's beautiful. A lot of people, unfortunately, come to the UK. They spend all their time in London, but Cornwall's really yeah, beautiful. Yeah, man. I mean, I used to go um, fishing uh, in the sea. Yep. To like, and we'd like fish for herring, and then we'd eat it. Like, oh, beautiful. I yeah, miss yeah. it so much. I've been there. Well, that's like, that's like an everyday thing for me when I was 14 yeah, and stuff. Like, uh, that I'm kind of sure lifestyle is what I grew up with. So. Awesome. But I didn't grow up in a, in a religious household. Mm. And we were kind of, I'd say that we were quite sort of conservative culturally. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, my mum my and my dad kept quite good tabs on us and stuff, I guess. We're quite traditional in some ways, but I'm just kind of your bog standard C of V. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people who grew up in this country, if you're not kind of assigned to being a particular denomination of Christianity, mm -hmm. you're sort of, your bog standard C of V, like you, you say you are and yeah, you know. Yeah, it's like a class, a <laughs> yeah, classification yeah. rather than a belief. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So like in term, but I was always interested in, in, in answers though. Like I, I suppose just saying like answers is all I can really say at the moment. Cause at the time, like I didn't know if it would be believing in a god or believing in a particular ideology or anything i just I, I knew there was i knew there was something to be found i knew there yeah. was a, a better way of figuring out why we're here and to just growing up in cornwall and in places with the countryside generally it, it encourages you even when you're young to just ponder a little bit more like i remember sometimes waking up in my i grew up in a little village i didn't grow up in a city or anything so sometimes being like being awake at night and just seeing just how incredible the universe is. Mm. Like it's not, it's not like London, like you can look up in the sky and you can see stars like every few centimeters yeah. up. It's just, and I remember even thinking when I was maybe like 13 or 14 years old, thinking like, this is, this is serious business. <laughs> like what we look into, you know, what we do with our lives and stuff, inshallah. And there's like, there's some serious searching to be done. So I guess I was kind of ready to find something but I didn't know what it was at that point. So, but I kind of, I, I kind of, that kind of manifested itself when I was about, 16 when I went to college because I studied to do studies of religions at mm. college. So oh, really? I obviously had some kind of 
interest in finding something, you know, that, that there must have been, but at the time... So why did you choose religion, to, to study religion at college? So the real what answer is because I wanted to do German, but I was dreadful at it. Right. And uh, the teacher, I did a little assessment and stuff, and the teacher was like, Sam, this is, you know, nicht so gut. Uh, she actually <laughs> said that to me. <laughs> yeah, said really? That to me. Yeah. Uh, it was a bit of sass. And then you went, what? What's that? Yeah, it was that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, like, I, I remember going to the office, and I had like, these options of different things I could choose to do, and s something pulled me to it. You know, subhanAllah, like we think in our journey, sometimes just the smallest little things, I could have been like, nah, not that, I'll do yeah. business studies. Or so mm. it could have been anything, do you know what I mean? On that day, with a different advisor, it could have been something else. And, yeah. and it was sort of, th that was the, the, the gateway for me to learn a bit more about Christianity, Buddhism, mm -hmm. Taoism, you know, Zoroastrianism, l learn about all kinds of different religions on that journey. And um, yeah, and it was um, maybe a few months in when we came across Islam and... Uh, that's sort of the foundation of where we are now. Really? So that, so where, at the point when you chose, oh, I'm going to do religion at college, did you believe in a God that, at that point? Or no. do you not think about care? Or? No, I cared. I definitely cared. Like I knew that I knew that there was something to be found. Right. But that, that's as specific like, as I could really be at that yeah, point. Because like even like growing up in the, co in the environment that I did, I don't know if it's the same for everyone here in the UK, but religion wasn't like cool <laughs> like it wasn't cool like you know growing up so it wasn't it almost seemed like a fa more favorable option if i could yeah. not choose a religion but choose like another cool alternative type thing that that would be the truth for me or something yeah, like that, yeah. that was all i really understood it yeah. to be at the time it's, it's so common man, yeah. in this country but, but when i came across islam you know there was no question anymore really the, like how soon how so, long? How long did you? What I'd say, because we obviously we, we work in terms here in this country, so we had like the term up until like Christmas, December, mm. and then when we came back was when we started studying Islam, and like a few weeks in, it was really interesting. There's no Muslims in my class. Even the person delivering these delivering my lectures is not a Muslim. Mm. She's a she's actually um, a, a Jewish feminist, very like left wing lady. Yeah. But um, it was actually kind of a, a blessing in a way that her ignorance l left, l l you know. How do I word this? I'd say like, because of her ignorance, she didn't kind of impose an ideology on it mm. at all. It was like, she just went to websites and found resources made by Muslims right. and found suggestions for lessons made by Muslims okay. and gave them to us. Oh, cool. So for the first few weeks of it, it was really like, obviously I've never met a Muslim in my life at this point when I'm studying Islam. So I'm, I think that Muslims believe the same as like Hindus and stuff. Yeah, I think it's as yeah. far like far Eastern as like Hinduism and Buddhism and stuff. And like, j just hearing that Muslims believe in, believe in Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, like, that, that kind of blew my mind a little bit, really, because we, we definitely don't hear that. We hear some things about Muslims, but, but we don't hear that. Mm -hmm. But it all really changed. Like I kind of went from a transition to thinking, oh, this is interesting to really believing it, when my lecturer sent us an assignment um, to listen to some verses of the Qur'an on Qur'an Explorer. Um, basically, the assignment was just to listen to it for a while and write about how it might make a believing Muslim feel. Oh, wow. And um, I remember it so clearly, Akhi, like I remember sitting in my bedroom upstairs in, in my house in Cornwall, looking over the Cornish countryside and putting on those headphones. And as soon as I heard those words of the Qur'an, like I knew, I knew that I'd dedicate a lot of my life to learning and teaching this language. Like I, well, I'd, I'd never heard sounds like Ayn and Saad and Qaf and Dad in my life before. I, I didn't even understand it, but the, the, the Qur'an has a melody that for people who listen to it and ponder over it, like they will replace music and anything like that for the rest of your life. Like I, and later on, when kind of getting a translation of it and reading about how the, how the Qur'an um, like brings like peace to the hearts of the Muslims, like in in, in the Quran, that the the, the the hearts find peace in the recitation of the Quran. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I didn't understand any of that. Subhanallah, Akhi, when you said that the um, te the teacher gave you like the uh, told you to read the Quran, I thought you meant the translation. Nope. And I thought you were going to say I, I sat at the countryside and the meaning of the and it was the actual Arabic and it inspired you. Subhanallah, it hit your soul like yep. it was meant. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Is that what is that what made you want to learn? the Arabic language then just that it wasn't it wasn't I became a Muslim I need to learn Arabic or want to learn Arabic it was first Arabic yeah it was the first Arabic cool. I think cool. that, that made me want to learn it but I'm not like a gifted linguist right like anybody who went to school with me would would um W would testify that um, I was just awful at languages at school. Like, I remember I, I kind of had an interest in other cultures and things like that. I remember mm. my mum came into school, like, oh, please let Sam do, do French, like in his final years at school. And they were just like, look, there's just no hope for him. He, wow. should, he should focus on his English, really, because his spellings are dreadful. <laughs> right, that, that, that was the advice for me. So like at school, I'd, I'd I didn't have like a track record of doing well in languages, but mm. for this Quran, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, as I said, as, as I said a little while ago, like, like Allah hasn't burdened a soul with more than it can bear. Like Allah had put this Qur'an in my ears and given me the blessing of hearing to be able to, to, be able to listen to it, even if not understand it yet. And um, it, it wasn't an option of, oh, can I do this? Can I find resources? It was like, let's do this. 
Um, you know, I, I kind of have a unique perspective on language generally, I think. Uh, like, I've been very grateful for language since I was very little. Like, I remember being about five or six years old in, uh, in co-op with my grandma and thinking how cool it was that we could use, we could move our faces and our lips and our tongue and our, and our breath to create sophisticated meaning and we could have like banter with a shopkeeper and we could be precise about numbers and I remember being very little and pondering over that and I, I kind of think that I don't, I don't really believe that if you don't speak a language, you don't understand the language someone's speaking, I don't really believe you're hearing them. Like so if someone's hearing a translation of what I'm saying, mm. they're not really hearing me, right. they're hearing a translation of it. Mm. And this is like, this is really common, like if it, you could test people on this, that like you could say to them, look, if you had a child, for example, and your you were separated from your child at a young age for whatever reason, and they grew up in another culture, say they grew up to be adults speaking Japanese only, and then you were united with them later, would you tolerate your relationship with your child through only translations like would you sit with your child mm. who's who's your blood and talk into google translate and believe yeah. you have a meaningful relationship with them yeah you're i don't right. believe you would but most other religions out there actually they expect that relationship with with allah they talk about that being their relationship with god or their prophet or whatever right like that's the relationship they have Subhanallah. i so didn't like, think of it that way wow. you know it's something so beautiful about islam that like allah has spoken to us like we have those words that Allah has spoken to us with and the, the idea that we sit around idly by as Muslims and, and put no effort into it, it's, um, it's kind of mind boggling to me really, especially when I kind of came into meeting more Muslims. Like at this point when this is going on, I've never met Muslim in my life by the way. Like mm. I don't even know at this point if you can become a Muslim. I yeah. don't even know if it's a thing you can become or if oh, it's like yeah. just for Arabs and stuff like that. But, but at the point all I knew is that like this Quran is, it's, it's like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. That's mental. It made me feel a bit <laughs> guilty actually. Like when he was talking about meeting other Muslims and 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 uh, Subhanallah, do you know what the, in J uh, Juma today, right? I was listening to the Quran being recited, and I always think this when I li hear the Quran, and we take advantage, um, we we uh, not take advantage. What's the word? Um, take it for granted mm. sometimes that what's being what you're hearing now is the actual message, exactly how it was intended to be delivered as the, uh, into the prophet peace upon his mouth and that's what you're hearing there is exactly the same as what the sahaba he heard and what mm. the prophet peace upon him heard when it, yeah peace upon him subhanallah so yeah so we you're not a muslim okay but you're learning Arabic, is that right? Yeah, but entirely okay. on my own. Like yeah, I'm yeah. going online and finding like, little videos for like Elif Berta and stuff. And like yeah. at the time, obviously like my pronunciation's awful. Like I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going onto Quran Explorer and obviously I can't read any of the Arabic yet because I'm trying to learn some of the letters, but I'm going to like a, so I'm, I'm actually making up a transliteration. I'm hearing like Alhamdu and I'm writing, writing like a l and then ha how do we do well i could probably couldn't even say it at the time so i'd be like alhamdu yeah and like yeah so i'm kind of i'm entirely improvising that's, at that time. that's really good like that's really common and quite a good way for a new muslim mm. to start learning the um learning how to pray and stuff to be fair yeah yeah that's awesome but at the time that that, that wasn't even the concern of mine it wasn't mm. like oh, i can't do it because i don't have i don't have a video course like yeah. i can't do it because there's not a college nearby teaching teaching Arabic or whatever, or I can't get, I don't know what the Medina books are. Like that, that wasn't even a question in my head. It was like, this needs to be learnt. So let's learn it by all wow. means necessary. So cool. let's learn it. Um, yeah. Like, by the way, when, when I say that, like, it's not, it's not a, a me blaming people who don't know Arabic, right? Like it is an undertaking. It's a mm -hmm. serious undertaking to learn Arabic to a meaningful level. And people should have realistic expectations about that. But the most important thing is that you, that is that you acknowledge it and you have an intention to actually improve and walk towards the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and actually your attempts to understand it. Because I mean, there are some incredible translations out there actually, like there are some that are written and, and a lot of them are improving actually. Like a lot of the ones that have been, that are like, um, like modern that have been produced in the past few years, they read nicely in English, mm -hmm. but this isn't a Quran. No. Like what you're sitting with isn't a Quran. It's, it's, it's an interpretation and a meaning which has been packaged up to suit your culture and what you can access. But, but as I mentioned earlier, like you're still having a, you're still having a communication with your child through Google Translate to, to some degree. Yeah. Right? It's not exactly the same as that, but I use the analogy of um, the difference we've seen, seen saying, are you joking? And you're having my leg. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean, you're pulling my leg. Sorry, yeah. like um, there's there's something in s saying you're pulling my leg is it, it touches something different than just mm. the, the actual facts of what I'm saying is you're joking with me. You know. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, the, like when my big struggle with Islam is that um, I've always saw, saw learning Arabic as a um, 
it's a massive hill like mm -hmm. it's and like i said before we started the, the episode that um I, I saw the the words and and the the wiggles and the dots and i was like there's no way in hell i'm dyslexic mm -hmm. there's no way in hell i'm gonna in gonna learn that like how am i gonna attempt that and then when i did what you did before like um before going to a teacher or whatever i just went online and stuff and you know okay i can do it right let's do it alif bar ta yeah okay but you haven't got a structure to learn and and when i went back to it so i'll do a few lessons go back to it and go oh, i forgot man what does that mean it's again i've got to look and 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 you you're right you need to you need expectations you need um a commitment uh, like a, a next level commitment and and i'm quite proud of what i've achieved um because i never thought i'd be able to learn another language mm. or or read another language let's say but i definitely could do more and and i i think I always thought that in my journey with Islam, uh, the weakness is that I can't read the Book of Allah, how's, how it's meant to mm. be read or, and understand it, how that the people hearing it for the first time would have understood it and how the Prophet, peace upon him, understood it and practiced it in his life. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, like it make when you talk like that, and I know it's not your intention, it makes you feel guilty, bro. Something that most people could do, like an advice for anybody watching this and for yourself that can just take their Arabic learning to a whole nother level, is just little and often. Yeah. Like I, I remember the experience when I started learning Arabic, like I started it when I started my degree in Arabic and I was looking at these pages of Arabic poetry and stuff, just thinking like, how do I go from now where I'm like, I'm, I'm confused and, and struggling just telling the difference between like a and and Kha. Like, how do I go from that to like, to this? But the way you go from that to this is little and often. Yeah. You know, subhanAllah, like I, I ponder sometimes on why, why Allah Azza wa Jal, why, why did he make the Salah five times a day every day? Right? And the salah, they don't take a long time when we do them. Mm. It's because this thing that's important that we build with Allah Azza wa Jal is built little and often. Like this connection that we have with Allah Azza wa Jal is little and often. And, mm. and our language learning can be much like that as well. Because a lot of the time, as I say, people have an expectation they can do a four hour seminar and come away with something meaningful. But mm -hmm. like the salah, learning the Arabic language is a lifestyle change for us. Yeah. You don't really get to a point and finish Arabic. I know. Oh, sorry, I was going to just add that. We actually ran a poll with new Muslims last year. Mm -hmm and yeah this is one of the the toughest issues for new muslims is actually learning arabic like the basics of it not mm -hmm. a kind of uh, at a degree level as you've done mashallah but it's just um and i was speaking to Sheikh green about it and i was like well, what do you think this is the case because this poll was sent out to specifically english speaking sort of countries right so it'll be predominantly the west uh uk the states and australia and canada right and he said that well you think about it as english speakers we're quite reluctant to take on a new language because we've kind of been spoiled yeah look at the media exactly. look at books literature everything everything's predominantly in uh, in english right uh you could call that the world language uh prior and primarily um so it's just like yeah it's just it's just yeah i want to give some input about that us being sort of lazy in a way of, spoiled uh, yeah, yeah. For it's choice. like that um it's like an analogy of the person that's got everything doesn't get up to get more because he's got it all mm. yeah definitely I, I would i'd be very interested to know whether it's the same for people who embrace islam who aren't english speakers like spanish speakers and stuff like that whether they whether they feel more capable of learning another language obviously mm. like it, it's certainly the case for us like and certainly in in the uk anyway like our our capacity for language learning like on average i would say is uh, I, I would be diplomatic and say awful um, uh, yeah, that that, that might be an awful. accurate term Arrogantly for awful Yeah, but I mean even like if you look at our education system Like most of us kind of learn a language from the age of like I don't know, 11 or 12 when we start secondary school And like it's almost compulsory to do a GCSE in it, it Other than some exceptions who were just awful like me at the time And yet how many people do you know who have got a French or German GCSE Who mm. are like fluent, capable speakers of it? Well, my answer is like none. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know a single one. So that I would describe that as not a very good ROI. Yeah. And that's not a very good uh, return on on our efforts. So I'd, I'd be interested to know if that's the case for reverts from other cultures who are used to learning languages, like like reverts from the Netherlands, where they and from Scandinavia, where they're mm. good at learning other languages. But like, it, it's something that's kind of one of the most important things about my work. I think is about making these Arabic and specifically texts is what I most care about making them accessible to English speakers because we have our own u unique unique problems really yeah definitely um, as English speakers yeah so bro how many languages do you know as like a, a like a decent level mm -hmm. 
I think five. So obviously, obviously, I, I include English, even yeah, though it's sort of it given is, to me, but yeah. it, it's still a language. Isn't it? Yeah. So like, yeah, um, and then British Sign Language. Oh, um, awesome! Yeah. So my wife's hard of hearing. Okay. And like at home, we we mainly use um, British Sign Language actually. Yeah. Oh wow! So, so yeah, yeah. So English, British Sign Language, Somali, and Arabic. And um, I, I did Spanish at A level, and I uh, got pretty good at it. But I'd say I'm out of practice. Um, now it's very rare for like a a, a European dude. A white dude to know Somali. Mm -hmm. So, what inspired you to learn Somali? My inspiration was um, I went to a university that might be one of the only in the Western world that offer African languages. Wow. Okay. Um, and in my final year, usually you do a dissertation in your final year on, on any degree program. But I'd done a dissertation on my year abroad previously, um, so I actually wrote one in Arabic mm. um, when I was at the uni uh, university in the Arab world. And I had this other module open. I was going to do another dissertation, but my supervisor was like, don't do that. That's boring. Like, learn Somali. Cool. I was like, what do you mean learn Somali? He was like, yeah, or Hausa, mm. or like, or Swahili or something. Yeah, it was like, yeah. you're at a university that teach this at like a high level. Yeah. So, and you're only here for another year. So he was like, learn Somali. Take the advantage. Yeah, yeah. so I was like, let's learn Somali then. He cool. signed it. He was like, go, go, your Somali class starts in 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So he was really keen on it. Are the, are the languages um, Arabic and Somali, are they similar in any way? Only in a pronunciation sense, I'd yeah. say. Um, yeah, people often have an assumption that a lot, a lot of a lot of our Somali brothers and sisters are competent Arabic speakers yeah. as well. Like the language is useful in their country, and obviously they're culturally close to Yemen as well. They're close to the Arab world. Mm. And many Somalis that we get here in the UK have often come via an Arabic speaking country as well. Okay, like my, my in-laws came via Saudi Arabia, so they're mm -hmm. all Arabic speakers as well. Okay, so th we quite often have that assumption about Somalis, but the Somali language is a ancient, really rich just beautiful language which is which is a different family like mm. arabic and hebrew and um you know and, and amharic and stuff are semitic languages mm. but Ara but somali is a cushitic language wow. and it's quite they're quite separate and a, a, mm. lot, a lot of linguists even argue that somali is quite a lot older than arabic even mm. like it's a it's an ancient and really like almost underrated language i think yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful oh, awesome yeah. can just for the people watching because i reckon they'll be like yeah right can you can you speak some somali i'll just us? give a little introduction yeah, so? yeah. okay Assalamu alaikum galabu anaxan. Magaigu wasami or London banda ganahi, like in Wahanka emits Cornwall. Yeah, it's just a little round up. Oh, mashallah. Can you get up the subscribers as well? Yeah, say, say um, subscribe to I era. Um, <laughs> um, you can do it, man. Yeah, I can, yeah. I've done it on my YouTube channel a few times. Brilliant. Um, uh, Fadlan, like, share your subscribe daha. Mashallah. Yeah. What about Arabic? Do you um, like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Let's let's There's not an Arabic put, channel put, for put that. Me on so trial, yeah. <laughs> sorry, very sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's Arabic again. But um, well, what I was gonna say, so we we went on to the languages, uh, but I want to go back because you're not in the story. You're not Muslim yet. Mm -hmm. You're just someone that's like touched by the Quran and yep. and you've fallen in love with this language. So you went for it and you started to study it. So in your head, what is this Arabic? at the time so is this uh, are you connecting this with a creator at the moment are you um or are you just saying that, that this where's this what is this thing i want to learn it on it what's the culture what's your thinking well, at, the, at the same time what's going on in parallel to this is i'm doing lessons on islam at right. college so i'm learning about what the pillars of islam are what the key beliefs are um all kinds of stuff like that so i am kind of starting to piece it together mm. um yeah so that's kind of all going along 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 the side of it i mean and like the, from the fr from when I first heard the Quran, I knew that this was something that I, d I didn't know I was going to become a Muslim or anything, but I knew that this was something that w would influence me somehow. And I, I kind of wanted to bring my family and stuff on that journey with me mm. and bring my friends because I, I had a really close group of friends, about six guys, and we knew each other all through school and everything like that. We lived close in mm -hmm. the countryside and stuff like that. And I, I kind of wanted to bring them on that journey with me and that they almost kind of they sort of thought I was a Muslim before I was one. Oh, even wow. like I remember like even after like months later when I become a Muslim and I told them they're like, we thought you'd been Muslim for, for months because oh, <laughs> wow. I've been telling them about it for ages and you know, to, you know, trying to give them my own dawah in, mm. in that way. And so, so like at, at that point, I think maybe I sort of started to become a Muslim even without consciously knowing I could just from the amount of knowledge and conviction that I kind of had wow. in, in these beliefs and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, something as simple as Tawheed as well, Akhi, like, you think that we have, we make things so complicated for ourselves in this dunya, like I'm studying Zoroastrianism and Taoism and all these different isms and stuff, and then there's like Tawheed, just believe in Allah, worship the Creator, not the creation. Like it's something that like that shouldn't that yeah. shouldn't be rocket science to us. <laughs> like that should be really simple. So so when I came across that, and I thought, Subhanallah, th this thing is actually what it's about. You know, surprisingly, I don't, I don't know if you've experienced this in your dawah as well. That a lot of people who come from a background like mine 
sort of Christian, we know what God is and we've heard of Jesus and the Bible and stuff. But most people, if they're not taught about very Christian ideas like salvation and stuff like that, they actually believe in one God. Mm -hmm. And they often actually, like the idea of Jesus that they have is often closer to the Muslim one 100%. than the Christian one, which is really interesting. Like you get it a lot. Yeah, like I was, I, was, I was reading this stuff and when, like after I'd become a Muslim and I'd met Christians, like I came across Christian missionaries when I was in Uganda and stuff. We'll, we'll come onto that, I'm sure, inshallah. Yes. But like, and, and yeah. they're telling me about salvation and stuff. And I'm thinking like, like that, that's not the obvious conclusion that we came to. Like, how, like when, when we grow up with mm. some level of Christian yeah. education. It's not your fitra. It's not yeah, it's not, it's not your fitra. And, and because our culture kind of ridicules religion a little bit uh, or makes it not important and more of an identity, when we're taught about Jesus and stuff at school in, in a secular way or if even if we went to Sunday school or summer school, I, I, my mum used to drop me off every summer they did a thing at the Baptist church mm. and it was like a free babysitter basically. Right, okay. So they, I used to go there and still then, like these people believe that Jesus salam was the son of God and they believed it was, was God. Mm. He was God. Um, yet I, in my head, it's still, right, there's the creator thing, that's God, right? And then there's this this son of God who kind of does the messages and does uh, heals people and does really good stuff and we should kind of like follow him because mm -hmm. he's from the like that person. But even, uh, and, and, and you talk to a Christian that's like, not fully practicing, they're just, or sees it as their culture thing, their fitra comes out because they, they'll go, no, Jesus isn't God, he's son of God. And then be like, that's not what the Christians believe. Like it happens at Speaker's Corner sometimes, where you're talking to someone that doesn't really think about religion. They call themselves a Christian because they're a cultural Christian. And then we kind of question them about what they believe and go, What's, uh, what, what do you think about Jesus being God? And no, Jesus God, he's not God, he's the son of God. It happened, there was this far right woman like, in Speaker's Corner, like, no, I don't believe that. And, and we they took her to uh, the like the the preachers that are in the speaker's corner talking about you know Jesus stuff and like yeah Jesus is God and she, it was the first time she heard it and she was the, this sort of person that was like anti-Muslim right wing but clung to Christianity because it's her culture and mm. it's kind of like the flag of the Britain we're, 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 and you don't even know what they believe mate and you're like propagating it like mm. so so you're hundred percent right it's so weird that that um. I've seen dawah happen in Africa as well, where um, in places in Africa where um, their question, do you believe that Jesus is God? And it's like, no, he's the son of God. It's this thing. People don't think it. They have to be indoctrinated into it. Mm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, subhanAllah. So Tawheed is so simple. And it's the only thing that makes logical sense. Mm. Everything else you have to twist and turn to make fit. Yep. And it makes me think of when the, the, our, what we believe as Muslims is Allah um, created everything and he communicated with his creation via prophets but we as the people either rejected that prophet or, or by time twisted the message mm -hmm. and you can I can imagine that this Tawheed was what was first and then from that they twisted the idea into and, and made Allah and have different attributes or less attributes or gave you know and twisted these isms that you're talking about mm -hmm. and it's just like like it's almost like the ego is trying to go well I know more actually I'm going to twist it and it's about like making things more complicated than it is when it doesn't need to be Subhanallah. it's crazy but yeah I took over that a little bit sorry mate no no problem <laughs> so where, where do we get to so we you are just you've just like you're you've said you're Muslim now how old are you when you become Muslim 17 your mates thought you were Muslim before because you were basically acting and, and talking about it a lot. 17, yeah, like, a, like I stopped drinking, like yeah, yeah. didn't have girlfriends, didn't, you know, like I'd, nice I'd, I'd stopped a lot of that stuff. So like, Even Muslims that do that, like this this white, know, yeah. this white guy, there wasn't even, <laughs> wasn't even saying he was a Muslim. He, pr he stopped it because he knew it was wrong, mashallah. I, like I remember some of those moments, like I, I remember stopping eating pork. Like I actually remember yeah. the moment when I actually stopped that, yeah. Wow. I remember being in a restaurant with my family, we'd been out for a nice meal and I'd had something with pork in it or whatever. I was sitting down and thinking like, Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah. it, like, it just, like it all just hadn't like stacked up for me really. Wow. Like I, just, I found myself at a point thinking like, so what am I doing? Like I just I realized some like so, some desire to to be one of the Muslims in myself mm. at, the, at that point. But. So seventeen, not right. We're going before you were Muslim. Had you met a Muslim yet? Never. I knew there was one Muslim at my college. He mm. was like a friend of a friend mm. of a friend, right? I wanted to say something. Yeah, um, yeah go for it. You, you you mentioned before, and I've spoken to other revets about it. Where this is before you become Muslim and you're looking into Islam. But you're sort of speaking to your family and friends about Islam and you're giving them dawah. That's what you said, right? Well, what's that process all about? Is it more about feeling them out in terms of what their reaction is going to be? Or is it more about, um, you know, 
maybe you're thinking, okay, let's see if this is the truth and see how they could chip away at it. Well, or was it like a, a number of things? What was the it's thought process behind it? There, there wasn't like, for me, there wasn't a conscious, like, let's test this intellectually. That wasn't what I was doing. I was just defending myself. Like, I couldn't help but talk about Islam to some degree. Like, if we'd, I don't know, we'd have a conversation about something, something being right or wrong or whatever, and I'd give the Muslim perspective. And I'd find myself just defending the Muslim position, even though I'm not really a Muslim yet. Yeah. Like, I haven't taken my shahada yet. But I found myself wanting to represent the Muslim position. And so it's, a lot of it was really just, like, intellectual self-defense, really, is what a lot of it was. Because that, that news, that, that's talk of the town when Sam wants to become a Muslim li living in the countryside yeah, in or the village countryside, in Cornwall. Like, so. Everyone knows each other. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I'm from a village like that. Yeah. Like, I, I used to, it's, it's so typical Cornish, but, like, I, I had a job when I was, like, 13 making pa making Cornish pasties in a local bakery. Brilliant. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's just it's exactly what you want from Sam, from Cornwall. <laughs> but, yeah, like, I actually had a job doing that. And I remember, because, like, like, bakeries obviously open early. We'd be in, we'd be in the bakery at, like, 5 a.m. or whatever, 6 a.m. or something. Yeah. And, um, and, obviously, that's, like, Fajr time. Like I'd start praying <laughs> at work yeah, and even yeah. like we'd have breakfast as well. And like, like the English breakfast comes with some stuff that's, yeah, and it's not halal, yeah. <laughs> some of it. So like I'd stop, I'd stop eating it. Like I'd start, like there'd be other boys from the bakery and they'd get like double bacon and sausages because I wouldn't eat it and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like I remember that becoming sort of talk of the town that like, uh, yeah, you definitely. know, Sam's become a Muslim or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> a yeah, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what it was. But yeah, but if we, do you want us to get to like the actual shahada? Yeah, like I want to know because like, you've not met a Muslim yet. Uh, yep. th there was a kind of a Muslim at your school and yep. you, I, I bet you were like, oh, I want to be his mate. Yeah. Yeah. What happened? How did you did you seek out a masjid or did you just do it yourself? What tell tell us how you took your shahada? I sought out a masjid. Right. Um, I was actually told about one. Actually, there was a there was a lady who used to work at my college. I'm a Lebanese woman, mm. um, and like I I told her that, that that like I wanted to be a Muslim. Like I basically was one. Just the only thing that was in the way is I hadn't like done a shahada formally, but like but you're, I meant it. You're working you know? with no pay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's an interest. That's an interesting thing to say, but yeah. Anyway, so like, so, and she told me about this masjid, like, because I'd seen it on Google, and we only have one masjid in Cornwall, yeah, and it's it's a little one, like right in the middle of right in the middle. Like, if, I really recommend anybody go there. Where is it? Like, so it's in a place called Carnan Downs. Okay. Yeah, it's close to Truro, which cool. is like the only city in the yeah, whole of Cornwall. Yeah. But um, it's it's just a beautiful little place. Like that place for myself and other brothers who embrace the slam down there is such a little sanctuary. Yeah, like, it's, there's something so beautiful about it that even the carpets aren't worn yet because. Like, it's kind of like a bittersweet thing. Like, the carpets aren't worn because it's not that busy. But it's something unique about that place that, you know, that's just something I always I always remember about it. But, sure but anyway, so I found this message and I started going there on the weekends just to go and, like, talk to Muslims and everything. I remember being really self-conscious about saying Assalamu Alaikum properly. Mm. And, like, I remember once I was going to leave and one of them was like, Assalamu Alaikum to me. And I was like, Assalamu Alaikum. I didn't say Wa Alaikum Salam. Yeah, yeah. And I thought about it for it. Oh, I was like, oh no. Oh no, I did it oh, wrong, Chris. Oh no, oh, no. I, got, oh. I got it wrong. I'm not going to look at him again. <laughs> I know, I know. So I anyway, so, so, I, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I remember going there for like a few weeks and they sort of thought they didn't they thought i was a muslim because i was like learning the quran with them and stuff like yeah. i started off oh, so you weren't a muslim yet no but they, oh, wow. like, they like thought I, they, they assumed that some shahad had taken place because yeah, at this point yeah. i've memorized some quran at this point because wow. all this time i've been in my bedroom listening to the quran like yeah. i know about 10 pages of surah al-baqarah at this point no way so like i'm si so like i'm sitting with the kids <laughs> right stop, stop. Wait, 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 hold on hold on what? What? Why? Why Man did he learn why 10 pages yeah. of Surah Bakra and he's not a Muslim? What are you oh. doing? <laughs> what People are watching one. this. What am I doing, man? So yeah, same, Allah. same. Allah Akbar. But yeah, the, mashallah. Why the delay? Well, it's just because I didn't know. People had like warned me and told me about all these different Muslims will believe different oh, things. You yeah. shouldn't get caught up with these okay. different ones. So I was like, I was nervous about just approaching yeah. the masjid. Like, I, I don't know what they believe yeah. or what all these different sects and stuff. I've never met a Muslim. Yeah. So I've got no way of navigating any of that. But when I met this this woman who worked at my college, I just had a bit of trust in it. Like, she seemed nice and of good etiquette. And she, I told her a bit about my story and stuff. And she just encouraged me. And so I was going there on the weekends. And then when it kind of got out that I hadn't actually taken my shahada yet, there was... um. There was an Egyptian teacher there. May Allah bless him. He snapped up the opportunity to, for, for me to take my shahada. So I remember, I, I remember it so clearly, like sitting on the floor at the front of the masjid. Like most of the, most of the jama'ah there are children watching me take my shahada because mm. it's on the weekends with like kids doing their like, yeah, weekend yeah. Quran and stuff. And um, I remember, you know, oh yeah, I remember, I remember sitting there in that very spot taking my shahada and like a something that is a real ni'ma about about my journey that. I'm so grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal for it's like Allah's given me the opportunity to study, right? And like I remember coming back to do the khutbah in that masjid and I stood in the exact spot where I took my shahada. Mm. Like usually you stand on the minbar and stuff and I but I 
I kind of made a point to stand where I'd taken my shahada, like yeah, literally yeah. three years earlier. And um, that kind of journey of being sat there, not knowing any Arabic, obviously, Ashadu and La, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like not, not, knowing, not knowing any Arabic, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, and then coming back to actually deliver the khutbah there after like three years or whatever is some, um, I, I really love that place. Like, you know, like it would be very difficult to raise my children there and stuff because Cornwall isn't, it's not, a, it's not an Islamic environment. Yeah, or yeah, it's, yeah. it's not even, like li living in the West, we don't live in Islamic environments, but we live in Islam facilitating environments. Yeah, but, yeah. but Cornwall isn't even that. But when I get the opportunity to go back and go to that masjid, it's, um, it's as I say, a real sanctuary for us. Mashallah, well, it's a, it must be a very emotional place for you. Mm. That's crazy, man. Ten pages of the Quran. Yeah, because as well, like, bear in mind, most people memorize from the back, don't they? It makes yeah. sense to learn yeah, yeah. Surah Al-Falaq. I didn't know that. Like, from, I just yeah, start, start from, from the beginning. The like, yeah, we yeah. like, we grow up, we learn, read story, we biff and chip and stuff from page one. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And we didn't start, yeah. we didn't start at the back. So, exactly. So I would just like, I'll just go on to like Quran doc, Quran dot com or whatever, and I'll just listen to it from the beginning because that's how Who, books work. Right, how did you get the idea that you have to memorize the Quran? I didn't. So you I, just couldn't did help, it. I couldn't help but memorize it. Wow. Like people who listen to songs on repeat and yeah, stuff, people yeah. learn all the, all the words to these songs and stuff, but like I'd listen to it and just found myself knowing going it. along with it, just yeah, knowing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I did, I, I used to, um, I used to part time do delivery, right? After work, I was like, for extra cash and that. I knew that my daughter was on the way and I was like, oh, I need to mm -hmm. save some money. And I just had that Surah Rahman um, constantly on in my headphones while doing that. And it, it got to a point where I hadn't actually, t I hadn't tried to memorize it, but I'm knowing it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. What am I doing? Why don't I sit down and learn this properly? So, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. If you, if you make that intention just to listen to the Quran more, it goes in your heart, doesn't it? Something it I recommend with people who have small children is just play like Jazamna in your house, just play it over and again. Like I know people who have just, they've really liked a certain recitation like Abu Bakr al-Shatri or however you like, and they've just had it on in their home. Mm. And they've realized like their six year old knows it. Just they've had it on in their home, like mm. on, on repeat, just because they like it. Yeah, it's yeah. something, especially with small children, you, 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 should, you should do. Like I've seen a lot of people have success with that. So you, you were 17 when you become Muslim. How old are you now, bro? 28. 28. So, wow, mashallah. Yeah. So what was the, what was the hardest thing for you in the first, like year of being a Muslim, what was the, what was the most difficult challenges you had to go through? Because Allah says in the Quran that He'll test the ones that say they believe to see if they will mm. and see their intention. If your intention's true, um, and whether you're just saying it out of whim. Um, so so we all all reverts get that hardship mm. when we become Muslim. So what what did you go through, bro? What? The thing that the thing that at the time felt the hardest was being forced to answer questions I wasn't ready for. Yeah. Like I'm like the from only non -Muslims, yeah, yeah from non-Muslims yeah being forced to answer questions I wasn't ready for mm. because there's a common idea that like to subscribe to an idea you need to know everything about yeah, it yeah. and um, and that's why everyone's agnostic about everything well yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so so that that was a real challenge for me because I can I know like you know there's, there's things that Allah says in the Quran that are very stern about this like who, who, like who is who is who who is worse than the person who makes up things about Allah yeah like I'd like there's heavy things about this and it's a, even though in theory like whenever I'm, I meet people who have embraced Islam I will say to them like you, you don't need to answer these questions you can always just say look I'll, I'll try to find out for you and I'll get back to you mm. like you know or, or whatever whatever works for that individual person right like but at the time I because I'm the only one, I, I feel like I'm letting Islam down yeah, am, yeah. among my people. Like if I don't have an answer for it, and that that was really something I wrestled with. Like there, there were things that were difficult. Like I, I had people really try to like humiliate me. I had people who would really like mock me and and stuff. But none of that was as hard as just wrestling with: Am I saying the right things? Like, yeah. am I am I am I doing things that are wrong? Like I was I was ready for things to be difficult. Like I, I was really ready for that. Like I, I wasn't expecting to embrace Islam in Cornwall and not have my fair share of, say, of yeah. challenges. And, yeah. and you know, I was, I was ready for that. But, yeah. but the, you know, the, the internal struggle that I had with not having the knowledge and not even having a place to get it. Like, yeah. like the, the masjid that I went to, it was only really for like reciting the Quran. And if I had questions, then they would answer them for me. But even some of these questions that non-Muslims are coming to me with, us as Muslims, we, we take care over them. Let's say, for example, like. Um, you know the Islamic position on having having or not having girlfriends for example like when you approach Muslims with that like that they want to be cautious with what they tell you anyway with certain things are halal and certain things are mm. haram and this is how you go about this and stuff but but like that's not the answer I need a good answer to just to go back to them with mm -hmm. and that, that that was a real challenge and yeah yeah so I'd say I'd say that was probably the hardest thing being involved in a close-knit community um, 
it, it's, it's very common. They just don't like, like any difference. Mm. Unless it's a quirky, oh, he's the guy that has that hat on, like he wears that hat. I went to an agricultural college because my one of my dreams is when I retire, I want a little small holding. Nice. Just to retire on this nice bit of land, inshallah, may Allah grant it me. I mean, I mean. Um, but so I was like, right, it's my last year for free education. Like, because that, you know, you get free education until a certain point. I think I was 20, maybe. I can't remember. Um, and I went to agricultural college to learn the basics. But obviously, it's full of farmers. Yeah. Like actual sons of farmers. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. I didn't think, like, and, and, and they've lived in villages and they don't know any different but their culture. Yeah. And like really into machinery and stuff. And I was like, I want to be an organic farmer and I want to sell rare breed chicken and stuff like that. And he's uh, thinking, What's, who's too here? why is he here? Too and he's a Muslim. He's a mu like, uh, they ripped <laughs> out me. And these kids, I was uh, like an adult, a young adult. They were kids. They just got straight out of school. You know what school's like, man. Yeah. Ripping it out of each other. It's like a prison. It's like, they just don't, no mercy. Kids have no mercy. It's open season. And it, uh, they just ripped out me. And, and me as an adult had my ego, my pride of like these little little kids making fun of me there to mocking my religion and on top of that I was starved of the Muslim community mm. and, I was, and I was struggling with my dean bec like because mm. I was like alone in this place it's actually near Northampton it's okay. um, Moulton College I don't know if you've got to cut that but um but yeah so um so <laughs> so um yeah so I um I, I was there for a year and it was really hard because I was completely isolated I went to the um uh the Islamic um university uh, what are they called I socks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, one of them, but um, I just didn't get on with anyone, right? Like, like culturally and stuff. I don't know. Mm. And yeah, I just was fully isolated. So, and because I was different, the different one, everyone just fingers on me. And I, I can imagine in Cornwall, but it would been it been hard like that, man. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I never at the time I didn't really sort of, I didn't feel sorry for myself. I never thought mm. like I'm like I, w I wasn't like. I didn't feel sorry for myself really. Like I wasn't kind of making up stories about how this is kind of pulling me down and things. It was like, I'm I'm, I'm on a mission here. Mm, like, Marshall you know, Island. I'm, I'm going to work hard at college so I can get good enough grades to go and do this. And I'm going to leave Cornwall, um, go to London to go and study Arabic. And like those, so obviously like I'm 17, so I'm on my first year at college. So I've got my whole second year at college, which is pretty much just more of the same. Mm -hmm. It's me, got my head down, studying hard, trying to get good enough grades to get into SOAS. That, that was where I went for uni. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like there's, uh, I can't, I can't kind of put my finger on anything that happened in that year in between, though. It's just kind of more of the same. Me trying to, like, trying my very best to practice Islam, and um, you know, more regularly going to that masjid as well, and getting to know the community more down there. And it's mostly Bangladeshis down there. Bangladeshis mm. who have restaurants yeah. and stuff. They do well down there, mashallah. But um, yeah, so it was at the end of that next year, in 2010. This would have been when I actually got accepted to do an Arabic language degree because I, like, I, I knew that was what I wanted to do. Like, I, like, I. You know, I, I kind of decided like over a year ago when I sat in my bedroom with the headphones on hearing Surat al-Baqarah because I didn't know what, you know, what the chapter of the bumblebee or the what Surah al feel. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's like, yeah, so then, then I was accepted to study in, study in London. And um, yes, yeah, so when I was 18 was when I moved to London to do my Arabic language degree. Oh, mashallah. Remember, we had to remind you about the, you with the hat on. Oh yes, <laughs> that's a it's that's a funny in, little story. A yeah, we'll take a little trip down memory lane yeah. for a second before we come and start in London. Yes, yeah, so there's this one day. I'm in Cornwall. It, that might have actually been a story that could have slotted nicely in before I went to uni. So I'm sat I'm sat with my hat on. Don't yeah. forget that bit. Um, in my living room with like six of my mates who are like my good close friends. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And they're still my friends, but I've just sort of lost touch with them in a way. Mm -hmm. So like we're sitting there and we're like, oh, okay, let's get some pizza. One of my mates is like, okay, I'll order it online, and. So I don't know how he managed to make this all work out so perfectly, but he, he was like, okay, I'll order it online and I'll drive. Um, Sam, come come with me and then you can hop out and go and get them or whatever. So I go in, we've ordered these pizzas online, I go in, and the person over the till looks at me and goes, oh, it must be Mohammed. I was like, what do you mean it must be Mohammed? It's like, because of this. And I was like, I was furious with her. Yeah, I was yeah, like, what do you mean my name must be Mohammed? And like, it all just clicks that my mate who ordered the pizzas must have just put my name in as Mohammed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <what a> <laughs> and, like, I turn around and like obviously it's a big like glass. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> Brilliant, so, British humour. I know, yeah. I love I know. it. And he's just at the window. <laughs> Like, and obviously, I've just got to apologise to this poor woman who thinks that she's just been attacked or oh, whatever. Oh, like, dear. Uh, yeah, so, 
That's the good stuff. What sort stuff. of hat was it? it? Was that one of those net cool feet? Yeah, sort of yeah, it was yeah. one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Brilliant. Yeah, so Did that, you have a beard at the time? That's the good stuff. Patches of Patchy, one. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm 17. 17 I've yeah. got patches of a beard. Yeah. And um, at the time, I wasn't like I, was, I sort of went through phases of trying to grow it out, but um, not very successfully. Mm. So I've got patches of a beard and a little hat on, and uh, yeah, and uh, so fair play. That was the well only, executed. The only Muslim in the village. <laughs> the only Muslim in the village. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mashallah. So let's go back to uh, you're at you're at uni yep. and you're and you're learning Arabic and yep. so on like that. So how uh, like so suppose it, so as you've been a Muslim for a couple of years now then yeah, yeah. a year and a half something mm. like that yeah and like it's, it's good that you mentioned eye socks actually because the eye sock at Soas took really good care of me like those brothers they saw that like this kid had come out of the depths of yeah, dark, deepest man. darkest Cornwall and had turned up here to do an Arabic degree and they knew they needed to give me some attention and make sure that I had the support I needed yeah. and everything and they, they, they took really good care of me alhamdulillah but so yeah so I'm living in London for that first year like to do a degree an Arabic language degree in this country like most colleges don't offer like A-level Arabic mm. unless you're an Arab they'll, they'll facilitate it for you but um so I'm starting from scratch Start Arabic from scratch. I'm looking at these pages of Arabic poetry and stuff, and I'm I've tried to learn like Elif Berter and stuff. But when you study on your own, and if you don't really know how languages work, then it's a real uphill struggle. Mm. And if you're if you're trying to make that work on your own, so um, yeah, so thrown to the deep end. Like a, 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 on an Arabic language degree, you've got some catching up to do. So in that first year, it's about thirty hours of contact time a week um, of just of just learning Fusha, like just learning standard Arabic for that whole time. And they just kind of beat most of Arabic's grammar into you and a few thousand words in that mm -hmm. first year. That's like all your job is. Like I actually started doing my Arabic degree as Arabic and Islamic studies. Mm -hmm. And like one of the studies was, was the study of Islam. And I was, I was really upset by it, to be honest. Like I, like c coming where I'd come from and the, and the Islamic studies I'd done at college were carried out by a woman who was using Muslims resources because she didn't know any differently. But then I come to university and this wasn't Islamic studies. Yeah, like this was orientalist studies, like this yeah. was orient this was this was orientalist <laughs> critique of Islam. Yeah. That's what it was, and they called it Islamic studies. So after a couple of weeks, I was like, "This isn't for me. This isn't really what I what I left my people and my my nice little bedroom in in the countryside for." So mm. so I just did straight Arabic. After that, I changed that module to Arabic culture or something <clears> like that. Well, like most of that year is um, is just beating Arabic into you, and then in the second year. Um, you get to specialise in some more modules, like you. Like I did modern Arabic literature, classical Arabic literature, and early Islamic texts, or something like that. So you've got a bit of a base at that point. So, yeah. And then in the third year, that's when I went to Palestine. So I did my year wow. abroad in Palestine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just stop there, bro. You went no. to Palestine, bro. <laughs> I thought, thought I'd keep on hanging. I'll, 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 I'll tell guessing. you what. I want to talk a bit about like um, it's quite. As you said, it really upset you, and it's kind of upset me as well that you went to do you went to university to learn Islam, uh, Islamic studies, and what it was was um, like trying to refute Islam. Is yep. that it? Yep. Subhanallah. Like, what sort of like? How long were you doing it for? Three weeks. Three weeks, and you're like, that was enough. Yeah. For me, like so interesting because you go to you imagine like the educated people of of university. I'm going to learn Islam and it's reasons why, like telling the people why Islam's not true. Mm. Wow. What sort yeah. of subjects did they do? What did they like? Just a little bit into it. I'm trying to think about what the kind of first thing is they sort of threw us into in the beginning. I think in the beginning they threw us into like quite controversial topics like abrogation in the Quran and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, you know, Sam from Cornwall probably isn't equipped for. But I don't know if there's, there was a naivety on my part and an ignorance, because I didn't really know the difference between like like Islamic scholarly institutions and like everything else. Yeah, I didn't really know that. I'd, I'd be the same, bro. Yeah. I think it's weird as well. Like, so you go to university to learn Isla like uh, Islamic studies and they go straight into, Abra not like, okay, so this is what like they believe and you know, the, what is the Quran? Where is it from? When like the, the life of the prophet be upon him, just a basic mm -hmm. one crazy but anyway yeah. let's not concentrate on that it just really interested me that did yeah. um yeah yeah so um you're in palestine yep what lessons did palestine have for you it's hard to um to put my finger on something in particular um i suppose so i'll tell you what I'll, let me rephrase it for you then bro and, and yeah 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 how's Al-Aqsa? <laughs> now allah blessed me to be able to visit a few times and because of the situation out there, 
it's more emotional every time you go. Like with a lot of experiences, it's like the first time is like, it's your first time, so it's amazing. But with Al-Aqsa, every time I said goodbye to that place, I thought I'd never see it again. And yeah. when Allah opened the doors for me to go every time, like there was, there was a brother who, who I was living with out there. And like, it's just a sweet memory that I've got with him, how we'd look at each other every time we got to saw that, see that place again. And um, so I'd say that um, Masjid Al-Aqsa is a masjid that, it's an experience that just keeps on giving really. Like every time you go there, I, I probably, I probably, I probably went there like five or six times and um, yeah, just incredible experience, absolutely beautiful there. But, but experiencing the hardship of the Muslims out there was something that I'd heard about and like a lot of people here talk about, mm. but, um, or even not even just the Muslims, like it's, it's, it's mostly an attack on the Muslims because the people, but like the regime out there doesn't discriminate against Christian Arabs either. Mm. Like their, their lives aren't, it's not like they're, yeah. like they're, they're, they still have to carry around an identity card and mm -hmm. they still have to go through checkpoints and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, to get to experience, but firstly a Muslim country as, as from like my own personal um, situation, being able to like, like in, in Nablus where I live, there's a masjid on like every street there yeah. and like conservative Muslim culture. Like I really got what I wanted for, from Nablus. Cause some people go to a Muslim majority country and they experience just some madness that they don't expect in a Muslim majority country to be like, but Nablus, I was, um, I was well welcomed there. It was exactly what That's I wanted awesome. from a Muslim oh, country. So, you know, so like I, I'd say, so that, and then also in terms of like a personal Arabic language learning journey, being in an environment where people don't speak English there. Like there's a lot of countries you can go to, like if, if you go to, even if you go to Jordan, like I knew lots of Arabic students who went to Jordan and mm. stayed in Amman, they could get by speaking English most of the time yeah, yeah. there in Amman. But like in Nablus, no chance. Mm -hmm. Your lecturers don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Like everything's delivered in Arabic. That's awesome. Like all of my friends from the masjid, all my friends at the gym and everything, they all only speak Arabic. And so it, so it was brilliant for my own kind of development. And you know, like it was, um, How yeah, was incredible. it for your development with your religion? Because we talked a lot about Arabic and so on, but going to so I've never been to a Muslim country before. Okay, um, and and my Islam in, in my head is is going to these converted houses where everything's a bit skew if because it's facing the Qibla and and so on like that. Knowing that when I go somewhere, I'm, I'm going to be a minority. I'm going to look. I've got to find somewhere to pray and so on like that. How? Like and I can imagine if I go to a, a Muslim country, there's going to be mixed feelings. There's going to be a lot of ease with the, those little things, but there's going to be a like I I always assume that it's going to be I'm going to be disappointed in the Muslims as well because you always hear things that are un-Islamic that Muslims are doing that's cultural and it's like oh man just hold on the rope of Allah. But you know I'm not in their situation, so I don't know. But what was it like for your for your iman and what was it like for your development in your religion in your belief and so on? A mixture of those things, really. Yeah. Actually. Like, but the the main point is, is like here in the UK, we're dealing with having to have very high willpower because our environment isn't facilitating Islam. Yeah. But in the Middle East, it's like your environment facilitates Islam, so it takes the ease off the willpower a right. little bit. Yeah, yeah. And that's always favourable. Mm -hmm. Like for us humans, what is just kind of going on in our environment on autopilot? It, that will all that will like most of the time just have the biggest impact on us as humans because we're you know, we're creatures of habit mm -hmm. and we take on what's around us and things like that. So like just but being in an environment that facilitates you praying, like, I mean, like if the Adhan, if the Adhan, if you hear the Adhan in a lecture, like you can go pray, like there, there's nothing getting in the way of that. There's no awkwardness even with like, you don't have like women come to like shake your hand and hug you and stuff. You'd like, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of things like that that just kind of tick along in the mm. background. Like when, when you live in a non-Muslim country. So like just to have an environment that facilitates your Islam, it is really beautiful. And then, of course, there are things like I remember the first thing I saw was like a place selling roses on Valentine's Day mm. in Palestine. I just like, what are you up to? What are you up to? It? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. But, like, but that's all it is. It's like yeah. a, a thing here and a thing there. Like if yeah. like people who want to have like a really sinful haram lifestyle, they need to go looking for it. Yeah. yeah. In a Muslim majority country, really. It's sort of the it's sort of the reverse of here. Like mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to have taqwa, you want to be upon tawhid here, you need to really go looking for it and manufacture mm. that environment around yeah. you. But it, might, it probably even varies between different places as well. Like, obviously, I was in Nablus for a year, and most of my studies, like in Egypt, have been in Cairo. And like in Cairo, you can find a good Islamic environment. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a big city; you can find everything there. But like, you you can facilitate a good Islamic environment for you. So, how was the how was the Kanafi? How was the what? How was the Kanafi in Nablus? So good, man. That's where we, we should go. We should go back just. Do you know what Kanafi is? What? No, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> what? What is it? Okay. Tell me. But this is the worst part about Kanafi. Is like if I try to explain it to you, what the ingredients are in it. That's a food. You don't get it. Okay, okay it's a dessert. food. Okay, let's start no, with no, that. It's, oh, a it's a dessert. Okay. It's a food. It's a dessert. Oh, is it a cheese back? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah, when yeah, I tell when yeah. I tell my countrymen, other white people, about it, it's a dessert with cheese in it, they're thinking like a cheese sandwich with like 
with like Cathedral City yeah, yeah, cheddar yeah. cheese in it. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> That's what mature thinking. cheddar, like Worcestershire like, sauce. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's cheese, and they put sugar and like syrup on it. Yeah. And, like, they're like, what are you talking pot. about? Pistachio. But we, we, yeah, we eat cheesecake, which is, <laughs> is cheese in it. I know. Um, I know, know. but it's, it's it's the warm melted cheese aspect yeah. of it. That's well, it's yeah. it's a it's one of the because I've had it, I just didn't know what it was called. Yeah. But really? it's like it's that it's it's che- it's flavorless cheese. So thus you can add the flavor to it, which is the sugar and stuff. Yeah. So like the the cheese is more there for for texture, right? But like. Yeah, there's like didn't a, there's like it still. What no. you didn't? No. Not yeah, because of the cheese. Song. I was Nablus just like, is the face. Yeah. I heard that's like the place that's to right. go to. For yeah, people Knef know like the Knefa Neblusia. People know that as like a thing. Like you go to Nablus for Knefa, you okay. know. And it was it was awful for my health being there. But um, I can imagine you take one for you know you you, you pick your poison, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, Knefa was my poison. <laughs> pick, <laughs> yeah. pick your poison, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. So, so um, you've come back now. You've come back from. Um, so you just spent one year in the Arab world. Yeah, yeah, just one year there, and then came back for my final year. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I, I did a dissertation when I was on my year abroad in mm. Palestine, and um, I had an opportunity to write my dissertation on a really like beautiful Arabic text that I love. It's it's quite an advanced text, so I don't have the privilege of teaching it to my students very often now. But it's called Rihla Ibn Jubayr. So mm. there's a travel writer called Ibn Jubayr who was from what, what is now Valencia in Spain, but back then it was a it was a Muslim it was a Muslim land mm. um, but he travelled like around a lot of the Muslim world around the Mediterranean and he actually has a chapter in his book where he describes Salahuddin al-Ayubi like actually meets him and oh stuff wow. he's in that kind of era in the Middle Ages yeah. but because of that's what the environment's like he describes a lot about the Christians like he describes loads about kind of the the, the just the cultural and religious difference dynamic between the Christians so I wrote my dissertation on that that's interesting. On, the, on the description of the Christians in the cool. of Ibn Jubayr it was um, it's very interesting because there's the whole world back then is just different to what we have assumptions about Muslims and Christians being like now. Mm-hmm. Like it's a whole, it's a whole different world. It's absolutely fascinating. Like hearing about how in some places, like the Christian women would dress like the Muslim women mm-hmm. because they were more respected that way. Like there were Christian women who would dress like the Muslim women now, and now we, subhanallah, so we, we have the opposite <laughs> really it's now. Crazy, isn't it? And then, you know. But anyway, like, I had the opportunity to write my dissertation about that. So when I came back, kind of brings us back to when I picked up Somali. I'd already done a dissertation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to my um, to my supervisor at that time being like, don't write another dissertation. It's boring, isn't it? Mm. Yes, it is. Um, do Somali. So we did Somali. It's amazing. I mean, that, going back to the, um, just quickly, going back to doing, working on um, old, old Arabic history, basically. Well, I, well, I learned something fantastic, uh, fascinating. So I'm really interested in history. I really like European history and Middle Ages and ancient history. And the most, and you know, when the Viking series came out, everyone got all like Viking crazy. And what we know about the Vikings is because I forgot his name, Subhanallah. Um, it was an Arab emissary. Right, that was sent to go um, talk to the Northmen and set up a, a, like a, a something with them. And it was his journey to go see, and they made a film about it, 13th Warrior. Have you have seen that? Yeah, no. With, uh, Antonio Banderas. Yeah. So all of the all of the Norse beliefs and practices we know because of an Arab Muslim. The name of the emissary is Ahmed ibn Fadilin. No. I've got something about Ahmed ibn Fadlan anyway. Um, go for it. Well, no, because I teach one of his texts in my programme. Um, yeah, awesome. Rih, yeah, Rihla ibn Fadlan is one of the texts because it's actually like he describes the people called the Rusiya. I don't mm. know if we're talking about the same people. Like now we hear the oh, term Rus, Rus. Uh, which is the um, the, the people that um, they, they were Viking like genetically, but they moved to Russia basically. Yeah, and they became their own like culture mm. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's fascinating because this this text that um, that Ibn Fadlan writes. The Arabic is so accessible. Like I love it because it's so rich in history. Like mm. you've got this Arab who comes from, I think he's um, he's under Al Muqtadir, I think in a, in Iraq, mm. and he's traveling to like what is like modern day Kazan or something like that, mm. maybe in in Russia, and um, and he's t- and he's describing these people who he calls the Rus about like what they wear, about what they believe, about what their women are like, about mm-hmm. about what their bodies and their shapes are like, about what tattoos they have, mm-hmm. and all kinds of things like that. It's it's really fascinating. Like I, I love that kind of stuff when yeah. we get to we get to see the we get to see another culture through the eyes. Of, of an Arab yeah. Muslim from yeah. the what, what is he like tenth century? No, no, earlier than that, like tenth tenth century. Tenth century, yeah, century yeah. 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 What's what's uh, yeah, th- what's amazing is as well um, these these like Rus. Um, they there was one king, uh, they were pagan, right? And there was one king that's decided we need to pick one of the because I need better like. Um, like uh, relations, relations, international relations. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what do we pick? We got Christianity, we got Catholic, um, like the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, or we got 
uh, Islam. So he brought, I, I forgot his name. We look him up, look him up. Oh. Like the guy that, the, like the, 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 the Vi yeah, the Viking that, the Viking that almost became Muslim, Viking. right? So, um, so he got three like uh, representatives of these religions, and they they would debate in front of him for to, to and convince him which religion is true. And he was about to accept Islam until he found out that he had to quit alcohol. <laughs> so all of Russia and maybe the Vikings of the ti uh, the uh, Viking areas as well, like um, <clears throat> Scandinavia, it would have been Muslim, bro. They would have been Muslim if it wasn't for alcohol. The love of alcohol, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. It's crazy, isn't it? But have you found it or was it too late? It's w I don't want to get refuted. I was in Quora, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, it's like Wikipedia, isn't yeah. it? It's no, Wikipedia is fine. It's right. We don't have to be factual. I know there's some history buffs <laughs> probably watching going, oh, you're getting it wrong. No, I remember but reading an article about, uh, and it's come up now, about mm. why did Vikings have Allah embroidered yeah, into yeah, their yeah. funeral clothes? That's what I was going to so, bring up as well. So yeah. I'm, re I'm really interested in this. So Vikings, um, so that some Vikings, when I say Vikings, it's not a nation, it's just a group of pirates, right? They, they went to invade Islamic Spain. Um, and what happened, the, the, this group, they got disbanded and lost and, and some of them fled into the kind of the central uh, Spain, Islamic Spain. Um, and they, they became Muslim, bro, and they integrated into the society and taught the Muslims how to make cheese. So wow. that, that dessert that you were eating Maybe. was because of some Viking with tattoos. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Can you find it? I'm on the BBC article right now. but uh, It's all good, you know, it's all good. I don't know, like, I, I feel like when we learn about things like this, like interaction between, like, Europe, or obviously we kind of, where we're sort of from, ethnically, in the Muslim world, I feel like it gives us a sense of belonging, mm. so somehow, like, a, how it's not actually, because we're kind of made to feel like Muslim interaction in the West has been since, like, the 50s. Yeah. We kind of get that impression, yeah. or, like, or the whole history of interaction between the Muslims and the Christians started at 9-11. Yeah. Like, we're kind, of, we're kind of given that impression. Yeah, yeah. Like, 16-year-old Sam in Cornwall pretty much thinks that. Yeah. Right, like there's a really interesting book that I used to be tutored by um someone who's like a professor of um, Cornish literature, mm. and uh, called Alan Kent, and he gifted me a book on my 16th birthday, and on the 47th page of that, there's a praise of po uh, there's a poem of praise of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not written in English, oh, written in Cornish. Cornish. Okay, written in the Cornish language. You know Ooh. how Welsh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know Cor I was, okay. was going to ask you that earlier, Cor but it okay, went Cor from my mind. Right, yeah. yeah. So it's written in Cornish. Yeah. In the Cornish language, there's a poem of praise of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the reason why I mention what page it's on is because Surah Muhammad is Surah 47 in the Quran. Subhanallah. Yeah, Subhanallah. <laughs> when I came across that. So w what did the poem say about the Prophet? Peace oh, it says um, that the, the crux of it is. Um, like may, may, may the pagans come to ruin and may the name of Muhammad be known or something like that. But, but who, wrote it? who wrote it? His, his name is, he's a king, Ted, Ted Tidor or something. It's like the Tudor time then, if, if that's the name, but it's Ted something, King Ted something. But it can be found if, if, if like, if you want, I can do a bit of content on it on one of my platforms so people can know about it and stuff. Because I've got the book at home and everything is sharp. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. So did, that, that, I was got because oh, we're talking about language. I know we're going all over the place at the moment, but oh. it's a really interesting conversation, mashallah. So did, did you learn Cornish? Have you learned any Cornish? Or you got any desire to? Um, no, not really. Like at school, there was some push towards it. And like, yeah. I, know, I know people who know some Cornish. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like at our masjid, we've got a brother, Jonathan. Shout out to brother Jonathan, who embraced Islam. And he's Russia. like Cornish, Cornish. Yeah. Not like us Emmets from like Northampton and stuff like me who moved there. He's like yeah. Cornish. And I think that him and his mum know some. But um, I mean, really now, they've mostly been assimilated now, the Cornish. Yeah. But the, there are some really unique things about Cornwall. Like m most people don't really understand how much of a unique place it is. Like it even has a different climate really to the rest of the UK. Yeah, it has, yeah. Um, like we've, I have palm trees in my garden mm. growing up in Cornwall. Like we have a really unique climate. And, mm -hmm. and even because of just where Cornwall is located, we've had like pirates from the Mediterranean come and settle in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. and, like growing up in Cornwall, I met maybe like, like s seven or eight people maybe who are Cornish. Like they've got very Cornish names and everything, but they're quite like slightly darker skinned, like jet black hair, yeah. really dark brown eyes. And there's like, there's always a, th we always kind of call them Spanish pirates. That's the thing we call them. Like, but um, there, there, was, there was someone that I knew in my Spanish class called Kathy. And she was like, she's just the example I think of in my head. Cause she was like, she looked like what you imagine like very Mediterranean people, like, like kind of olive toned skin mm. and dark hair, dark eyes. And it's really interesting. Like there's a theory that they're kind of descendants of, of people from you know, the Mediterranean who settled yeah. in Cornwall. I heard, um, I heard that um, they, 
southern Ireland has a lot of genetics from Spain mm-hmm. that would have gone back uh, in like the caveman times, you know. Wow. SubhanAllah, when well, they, they would have travelled and yeah. So you get a lot of people in the south of Ireland that, that have got really dark hair and stuff, but quite pale skin. So mm. you, yeah, SubhanAllah, yeah. SubhanAllah. How we all meet each other all through the world. SubhanAllah, <laughs> SubhanAllah. So, uh, mashallah. So we've like, I've really enjoyed the chat today, mate. It's been wicked. Likewise. Right? But what I want to do is I want to um, ask you to tell the audience some advice or give them advice on uh, what would your advice be on to any new Muslim, okay, or born Muslim that doesn't really know Arabic or whatever, how, how would you, what advice would you give them to get started with it and be consistent so they can learn the Quran for themselves? The first thing I'd say is have gratitude for this Islam. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen certain souls and reached into certain lands to guide certain people over others. There are some people who live in a Muslim country and hear the Adhan five times a day, but they don't receive guidance and they're not grateful for their Islam. Mm. There's something beautiful that Allah says in the Quran, forgive me, I'm, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I remember it, but هُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ عَلَىٰ عَبَدِهِ آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَىٰ النُّورِ He says that like, he is the one who sent down upon his slave um, c- clear verses, لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ to take you out of um, مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ out of the darkness, إِلَىٰ النور, into the light. Mm-hmm. And we should, we should understand that, we should know that this is a nur. You know, what we did before was al-dhulumat, was the darkness. And firstly, so we should have a gratitude for our Islam and, and hold tight to it for that. And then in terms of just navigating the world as, as a new Muslim, like, leave off the things that doubt you. Now, there's a hadith in, um, in, the, um, in, the, in the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi as well, actually, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, ma yuribuka ila ma la yuribuka. Leave, that wi- leave that which causes you to doubt. Um, for that which does not cause you to doubt. Mm. Yuribuka, obviously, sharing an Arabic w- root with the term raib, like in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, there is no doubt in it. Yuribuka doesn't cause you to doubt. Mm-hmm. Right? So, um, yes, yeah, so I'd say that's what you should do as like a new Muslim when you're kind of making decisions about um, should you say this thing to somebody? Should you give this answer you're not too sure about? Should you, should you practice this thing that you don't have an evidence for? Like, leave that which causes you to doubt for that which doesn't cause you mm. to doubt. It's brilliant. MashaAllah. What about... Um, what about for the um, the like when the born Muslims that have new Muslims popping up around them haven't really dealt with them before? What advice would you give them to um, to, to help these new Muslims learn the Deen and maybe even w- Arabic speakers how they could teach Arabic to these people? Depending on what country you're from, yeah, have some sensitivity to the actual culture of mm. those people, because unfortunately I've heard something really unpleasant spewed online, especially on TikTok, about how white people not having a culture, right? So like. Like wh- when I embraced Islam, there were certain things because of my culture that, that people weren't aware of, so never taught me about those things. Like I remember getting to university and a brother first teaching me about how to clean myself properly when I went to the toilet. Yeah, That's yeah. something that a lot of people just wouldn't, just they, they don't know that there's this thing that, 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 we, that people need to learn, yeah. for example. Or, or even like, like just, just th- there's things that the revert coming to Islam who isn't familiar with it, that born Muslims take for granted. Yeah. Like one, I was thinking earlier, like in obviously where we pray Jumu'ah today, the way that the like um, the way that the room is laid out is that there's kind of like individual prayer mats almost is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I remember first going into a masjid and thinking everyone sort of got their own. Yeah, yeah. Like I just kind of I just thought that that was the thing, and I remember being stood there and thinking, oh, this is my space. And then there's people touching toe to toe, 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 shoulder to shoulder. What are yeah. you doing, bro? Yeah, it's it? my what you it's doing. My one. <laughs> how, how do you um, you know, it's a sensitive issue. It's like you know, how do you how does a born Muslim sort of explain that to? A new Muslim. Well, it needs to come up as uh, come up as the things come up, really. Like with, well, like with, with the case of learning how to clean yourself with me, right? It was when I was at university. A brother that I was friends with used my toilet. And I was like, "He's your bob, my bro. Where's, where's your lotta, bro?" <laughs> <laughs> so like, it came, it came up like that yeah. because you can't kind of assume these things. Like, mm. it's it's not right to approach someone who's embraced Islam like a year ago and been like, "Have you heard of the bodna?" <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't really do that. I call it the square. <laughs> We got nice. we, we got this thing that was like a squ- instead of you know most people have a, like a teacup thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's teacup a lot thing. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you had the but bomb gun. Yeah, <laughs> and why would I use a little teapot when I can have like say it does the job better? <laughs> Excellent. But yes, they need to come up as they as they do. But I've just I've experienced people who are born into a Muslim family. Almost, I've almost felt people like. Um, just not be sensitive to the struggles of a of, of someone given their particular culture like mm. um there, there's specific things for us here in the uk obviously but wherever you are like well, wherever you are there are kind of specific things that different cultures have their own vices for yeah and, yeah and um, to be sensitive to those things so I basically uh, like as as a as an established muslim helping a new muslim 
take the time to get to know the person and what where they're from and their background so you can give them advice that suits them instead of just giving them generic advice yeah exactly mashallah i think it's been wicked man i've got so, a question yeah go for it Hold on. um is is obviously literally when you brought up uh, al-aqsa and philistine i was thinking of it at the time and I actually came across this American brother. He was non-Muslim, and he was learning Arabic within jo in Jordan. Wow. And we were just within the vicinity of Al-Aqsa, and uh, they have certain specific hours for non-Muslims to actually visit the compound. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's usually like a few hours before Dhuhr. Uh and um, yeah, non-Muslim, and you could tell he was just captivated by it. You know, it's absolutely beautiful, as you know, right? Inshallah, you better go there, Inshallah, as, uh, Inshallah. Ben. But it's just, what advice do you have? For non-Muslims who are getting into Arabic and appreciating it for what it is, what's their gateway to Islam from there? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Well, I would say if you're learning a language, go to the pinnacle of its literature. It's the thing you should aim for. And there can't be much question that the Quran is the pinnacle of the Arabic literature. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I've experienced, even at the university I went to, like they would teach other Muslim majority languages like Urdu and Bangla and stuff. And sometimes there'd be a complaint from the students that like, oh, why are we learning like Islamic poetry? Like, how are you not learning Islamic poetry when you're learning Urdu, for example, right? Mm. Like, but um, so, so if somebody's learning Arabic, then I'd say not to shy away from that. Um, you know, if you if you want to learn Arabic, then go to the pinnacle of it, which is the Quran and, and, um, and read it in its original language and appreciate it and... I suppose that's maybe the best answer I've got. Um, yeah, fair. Yeah. Oh, oh, sure. So um, we've got one request here from Brother Jamal, and I think it's going to be a bit of a contagious request amongst the Ira brothers, is that uh, where can we get some halal Cornish pasties? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what a question, no, no, mashallah. Oh. Okay, if you go to Cornwall, uh, make sure you check out Helston Grill. Grill. There's, there's a brother called Hassan who runs that place and uh, he'll probably sort you out. It's actually a Turkish place, but he's done halal Cornish pasties for us. Whereabouts is it? Before. It's in Helston. Like Helston, yeah. like book, book ticket. Yeah, no, we're doing, we're going <laughs> there. Because I love Cornwall. Well, holiday. if you come down, inshallah, let, let me know. I'll make sure you're well taken care of, inshallah. Because I've um, got good brothers down there and we'll, uh, we I'm always not like joking, visitors. It? I'm going to hold you to good, this. Yeah, I want that, on, a please. family, like, like family fun mm. in Cornwall. Yeah, we might do like uh, arrange some sort of dawah trip there as well. Good. There are some brothers yeah. down there who have yeah. done like dawah training. I think they had dawah training yeah, very yeah. recently, actually. I'm, I I'm think not Imran sure. Imran Hussain. Right. Uh, okay. Cool. You, I wasn't you, exactly you. sure who it was with, but um, oh, no, no, Murtada. Murtada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he Chavi, told me yeah. he went. Off. Right. He okay. went a couple of weeks ago. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, he probably would have met uh, brother Jonathan. I told you about. Yeah, probably yeah. met Hassan as well, actually. But, um, oh, yeah, because those those brothers down there, they they need it. You know, I've I've been at that masjid a few times when we've done open days and things like that, and. And it's a challenge. People need to be equipped with um, answers and a good understanding of the deen themselves in order to handle that. Yeah, definitely. So. Talking about halal Cornish pasties, what another thing that I want is halal haggis. <laughs> so I'm, I haven't had haggis since back in the day. Take it too far there, come too, on. Too far, okay, come okay, on. okay. Too, too stomach with too everything British. inside it. And oh, mate, you don't get it, it's amazing. Right, okay. <laughs> so, Sam, I was, we're going to end it now, but before we do, I think I, I want you to tell the, tell the audience where they can find your work so, um, and what you do on social media and so on. Great. So, I'm a person who just cares deeply about language. Um, obviously, for me, being a graduate in the Arabic language, um, I do an Arabic writing club. I run a program called the Arabic in 60 Steps program. But um, really, people can just go to sammartinburr.com. Like absolutely any platform, my podcast, my YouTube channel, my Instagram, my TikTok, mm. Sam Martin Burr. That's, it's the same on, on all of them. So it's mm. nice and simple for you guys. Sam Martin Burr. That's Sam Martin it. Burr. And I will pop it in the description below. Inshallah. Bro, it's been amazing. Pleasure. It's really good. Mm. Really good chat. I really enjoyed that. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I really did. Um, if you're a new Muslim and you want to learn more about the deen, more about Islam or your religion, then uh, there's a link below. If you're a Muslim who wants to give dawah, we do free dawah courses online too. Link below as well. And if you you want to take it to the next step, you want to help little old Muslim, new Muslims like Sam and me when we were we, we first we needed that help, that mentoring. You can learn to be a mentor and actually be en enlisted into the mentor program. So once again, salam alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.